do, allelu. Everybody sing allelu, for the Lord has risen, it is true. Everybody sing allelu. Thirty years he walked the land, allelu, allelu. To all in need he lent his hand, allelu. The Code of Canon Law of 1917 says, The primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of the children. The secondary end is mutual support and a remedy for concupiscence. The Code of Canon Law of 1983, however, says, The matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life, and which is ordered by its nature to the good of the spouses and the procreation of the education of offspring, has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament between the baptized. So, the canon law of 1917 seems pretty straightforward and it's easy to understand. The primary end of marriage is the procreation and education of children. The Code of Canon Law of 1983, however, once again attempts to change Catholic teaching, even if it is somewhat subtle. Now, something new and something novel has supplanted the procreation and education of children as being the first thing on the list. Now, the first thing is the good of the spouses. Something straightforward has been replaced with something very vague, something unclear. Now, the main purpose of marriage is something called what's good for the spouses, but just exactly what is the good of the spouses? You know, future generations will probably look back on all of this and they'll be amazed at how almost all the entirety of the Catholic world just ignored and accepted all these changes. It's almost like everyone's judgment has been clouded. And in this regard, the first thing was that the writers of the Code of the Canon Law of 1983, they felt in their hubris that they could arbitrarily change Catholic dogma and no one noticed. And the amazing thing is, almost no one did notice. There is a footnote to this section of the Code of Canon Law of 1983, and not surprisingly, it refers us back to the last document of the Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes, for support. It says, Marriage, to be sure, is not instituted solely for procreation. Rather, its very nature, as an unbreakable compact between persons and their welfare of the children, both demand that the mutual love of the spouses be embodied in a rightly ordered manner, that it grow and ripen, Therefore, marriage persists as a whole manner and communion of life and maintains its value and indissolubility, even when, despite the often intense desire of the couple, the offspring are lacking. So, the council document is technically correct in stating that the marriage is not instituted solely for procreation, but the document is devilishly clever in its wording by suggesting that all the other feel-good, secondary, and tertiary purposes of marriage are actually more important than procreation. The last sentence of the paragraph, while again technically correct, leaves the reader with the impression that, well, procreation really isn't all that important after all. And all this confusion carries over to even another post-conciliar document, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It says, the matrimonial covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole life is by its nature ordered toward the good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. This covenant between baptized persons has been raised by Christ the Lord to the dignity of a sacrament. Again, this nebulous concept of the good of the spouses is listed before the procreation and education of children. Is it any wonder that nowadays there are so few large Catholic families where a couple or a few generations ago it was the norm? Modern Catholics contracept at about the same rate as non-Catholics. Is it any wonder that modern Catholics feel free to get annulments and divorces whenever that they feel that what's going on in their marriage isn't good for them? Because who cares about the children? The post-conciliar church tells us that they're secondary. What's really important is me. It's whether I feel happy at this very moment in time. And we should be clear about this. We live in a dystopia and people are sleepwalking through it. This last week I corresponded with a subscriber and we both agreed that even when you very patiently and rationally try to explain how Catholic teaching has changed to your friends and family, they probably won't believe you. They'll assume that the church is on solid ground and you're probably mistaken. And worse yet, 
they'll think, oh, you're probably a heretic. Most people seem to be content living in this very ugly dystopia where good has become evil and evil has become good. And in this dystopia, not only do governmental and societal pressures work against us from living out our faith, but so does the post-conciliar church. Some people say that the errors of the Second Vatican Council were brought about by the infiltration of communists and Freemasons into the church. Well, that might be part of it. But there's something much larger and much more sinister at play here. Something older and more diabolical. And it's been attacking the faith for centuries. Its tools have been the Western Schism, and then the so-called Protestant Reformation, and then the French Revolution, then Socialism and Communism, and finally the Second Vatican Council. And all of these things are just symptoms of something even larger and something even more horrible. Supporting these symptoms is a disease, and the disease is Satan himself. He has for some time been allowed greater power to roam about the world seeking the ruin of souls by spreading his own spirit of rebellion. Now, children hate their parents, wives hate and resent their husbands, and men hate responsibility. And that so many people do not see this going on nowadays just shows just how powerful Satan is in this world right now. We have a limited number of tools to protect ourselves in this dark age. Chief among these is prayer. And if you are not yet enrolled and not yet wearing the brown scapular, I suggest that you start doing so. And if you are not yet wearing the St. Benedict medal, I suggest that you start doing so. Well, I hope you enjoyed this installment. We'll be back again in about a week with another one. But in the meantime, please check out my Facebook page, which is linked down below. Every day I add uh, additional content that you won't see on this YouTube channel. And please, pray for the church.